Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world. This is Ben Nella. I'm a professor at uh, University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and I've also got some visiting positions in various universities in, in China. Over to you, Vicky. I'm uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon to all. I'm Vicky Valdez Busso. I'm a Scientologist and a research fellow at Federal University of Paraná. Uh, I did my postdoc with Ben from uh, 16 to 19 uh, in the University of Aberdeen, so I'm still honorary research fellow at that university. Since 2020, I'm associate editor of Scientology, and I've been recently assigned as executive editor of Scientologica, a new open diamond uh, access journal that we're going to be ready to receive some submission next month. So you can go ahead, Ben, please. Okay. Well, what we're going to do today is give a brief introduction to deep water systems at Outcrop. Um, it's going to be a bit of a lightning tour, um, a sort of virtual field trip. Um, some opening remarks, really, some deep water systems in the subsurface uh, can act as reservoirs for fluids over a whole range from hydrocarbons, water, CO2, and hydrogen over time scales ranging from months to hundreds of millions of years. And ancient deep water systems can be regarded essentially as large three-dimensional bodies of porous media with spatially varying properties. And one of the best ways to predict those variations is through an understanding of depositional architecture. So we're going to talk about the depositional architecture of ancient deep water systems as seen at outcrop as potential analogues for the subsurface. Now, the problem is that deep water systems are highly variable and that each system is really only an analogue for itself. This means that we have to look at as many systems as possible in order to create a range of generic models that, though they may not accord exactly with any particular system, can act as a guide in subsurface prediction. So we're going to show you examples from a range of different systems in a very brief virtual field trip. And we'll start by differentiating the three main elements of deep water systems, namely channels, sheets, and mass transport deposits, and then break these down into their component parts. I'll be giving the first part and then Vicky will take over for the second part. So firstly, channels. Now, submarine channels are conduits through which sediment gravity flows like turbidity currents and debris flows pass on their way further down dip. Our modern channels are negative features on the seafloor, much longer than they are wide, varying in scale over two orders of magnitude. I compare this sample from uh, southwest coast off Spain, which is only about 100 meters wide, with this one from the Tyrrhenian Sea offshore Italy, which is about eight kilometers wide. Where they aren't bounded by erosion surfaces, such as these two, uh, they typically have levees built up by overspill from the channel, like this one, which is the North Atlantic Mid-Ocean Channel. And you can see from the scale there that the channel itself is several kilometers wide and the levees are tens of kilometers wide. Now that's an exceptionally large example. What we see preserved in ancient successions, however, are not the channels themselves, um, but the channel fills. They form as the channel becomes progressively less effective as a bypass pathway. Since the channels evolve and shift over time, the size and shapes of fills can bear little or no relationship to the size and shape of the parent channels. Okay, we're now going to um, switch to Stratbox, which is this um, virtual reality tool. Now, the first example I'm going to show you um, is a strike section of a Lake Cretaceous slope channel system in Western Mexico. And this illustrates rather nicely a number of common features in larger channel systems. Now it consists of a hierarchy of um, components. Let's shift over here and have a closer look at that. With each level in the hierarchy typically bounded by a basal erosion surface, and that includes the system as a whole. 
and, and that's often overlain by a lag or mass transport deposits and then followed by a broadly fining upwards succession. And this reflects initially increasing energy of the flows, producing a channel form erosion surface, followed by decreasing flow energy, producing aggradation of the fill. And they're typically arranged repetitively. I'll come on and describe this uh, diagram later on uh, because it's quite useful in describing the individual elements. So what we see is go through a cycle of erosion, aggradation of different styles, and then the system shuts down and we start over again. Uh, and this is evident at various scales from individual channel elements up to the entire channel system. But often the smallest components um, that can be seen on, oops, wrong thing there, um, that can be seen in regular seismic would be that of a channel complex. Um, that's the terminology I'm using for this presentation. It may be given various names for, by different people with their own systems, but the, the architecture is essentially similar. Now, channel complexes are generally of the order of hundreds of meters wide, maybe up to a kilometer or a kilometer and a half, and tens of meters thick, and maybe up to uh, 100 meters thick. Now, in this example um, here, the base of each channel complex, given with a heavy red line, is um, deeply eroded into the top of the previous one. And the erosion surface is followed by a sequence that broadly divides into a lower, highly amalgamated coarse grained interval. And that's succeeded by an upper interval characterized by a stack of these meander belts uh, that are stratigraphically separated by thinner bedded overbank deposits that are shown in, in green here, representing alternating phases of graded and aggradational channels. Now, in this example, um, there's a lot of thin bedded material in the system. Um, this, all this green stuff is thin bedded material, um, both within the channel belt here uh, as flat terraces and confined or so-called internal levees. And as these larger levees uh, built by lava flows, uh, larger flows. Um, now the difference between terraces and internal levees is uh, basically determined by whether the overspilling turbidity currents actually reach the confinement of the channel belt. And if they do, then it produces flat terraces. And if they don't, it produces these internal levees. And where the flows are big enough to overtop that confining surface, whether it be an erosion surface or levees, uh, then it builds up these larger levees, which may subsequently be modified by bottom currents. So let's go on to the next scene. We're actually going to start looking at uh, a model of the outcrop here. OK, so this virtual outcrop model um, is about 400 meters long. 500 meters long, and it gives us a couple of hundred meters of a stratigraphy. And it represents the top of one channel complex set and the base of the next one. If we zoom out a little bit, we can see a stack of these channel complexes. Uh, this is the first stage. That's the second stage. Here's the basal erosion surface of the next channel complex. Up we go, that's the first stage, second stage, and see that again. In fact, we're looking at this section here. So uh, the basal erosion surface here of this channel complex, it looks pretty flat in this section, uh, but that's because we're, we're close to a, to a dip section here. Now, the lower part here is dominated by these meander belts. So if we look at this again. We're looking at this stage. Now, this stage progresses into, into this one. And as we see from the model, we're getting uh, meander belts stacked on top of one another. So in fact, there's one here. That's a different one there. 
very often they're more widely separated than this. So what's happening is that we're looking at the belt of a graded channel, which is just moving sideways. And then we have an aggradational phase where the channel moves upwards. And all this thin bedded fine grained material here is actually overbank to the channel when it's grading. And if we actually look at what's in here, this is a, a log through this section here, but we can move it around and, and scale it. Let's scale that to something that's a little bit more like a true scale compared to the outcrop. Then move it back in and up. We can actually compare that to the to the outcrop itself. And if we zoom into that, we'll see that actually there's a lot of sand in here. And that's a good indication of how much of the potential fluid reservoir is actually contained in the thin bedded and fine grained material. And that's not uncommon in these channel systems. Now these meander belts, let's get rid of that and this, uh, can be up to a kilometre wide or more, uh, but they're generally only about 10 metres thick, so we'll quickly measure that. That's almost exactly 10 metres thick, this one. Um, and if we get a fortuitous section, we can actually see Take the model. Some lateral accretion sets. You see here this lateral accretion surfaces. Let's take a quick look at the basal surface of this channel complex up here, the next channel complex up. And it's actually a little bit complicated because the base of the channel complex is not here, which it appears to be there. It's actually a little further down. And what we're seeing in here is coarse grain material interleaved with slide sheets. And evidence of mass movement like this is very common um, at the bottom of, excuse me. Okay, let's go on to our next example. And this is, uh, let me quickly switch to, PowerPoint here. This is an example from Southern Chile. Start the movie. And you can see that this is a um, nicely well exposed system on a highly glaciated terrain. Uh, it's a uh, Lake Cretaceous system. It has about 400 meters of relief, um, but it also benefits from outcropping in a, in a sinkline. Uh, so the outcrop here, the mapped outcrop is about 10 kilometers long, and there's a channel system that cuts obliquely across it here. And that channel system has migrated a little bit uh, in this direction from left to right. And on both sides, it has uh, levees, one here and one here. Switch back to strap box. And look at okay so this is a composite section through this through this system and it has a broadly similar architecture to the one we've just looked at in mexico it's made up of channel complexes, there's three stacked on top of one another here, and these are the erosion surfaces bounding at the lower surfaces of those channel complexes. The upper one, you can see the overall fining upward succession. The lower ones have largely been eroded away. But one thing that's different about this is that the system uh, has migrated substantially um, to the right. And there's a cartoon that that shows that. 
So we've got a stack of channel complexes migrating from left to right. Channel uh, levies are regrading on the left hand side and their levies are being cut by the parent channel on the right hand side. Now the levy is made up of thin bedded turbidites. And this is fairly typical of, of levy sediments. Um, quite often ripple cross laminated, rather thin bedded. Uh, quite commonly the top of the sand is fairly sharp, goes into a silt to mud, and each one of these couplets represents the deposits of one turbidity current overspilling from the channel onto the levee. Uh, commonly, um, levee sediments are very, very regularly bedded, so the spacing between these turbidites tends to be fairly regular and the bed thickness tends to be fairly regular and more or less the same at any one point on the levee but something that we usually see is that the um, levee sediments thin and fine away from the channel and the overall net to gross decreases so that gives you a pretty good clue as to which direction the channel is in. In this case, obviously the channel is out to the right and the levee is thinning and fining off to the left. And that's how we can tell um, that this levee here is related to, to this channel. However, um, rather strangely, a lot of the paleocurrents in the levee are towards the channel. And those paleocurrents are indicated by the, the ripple cross laminations on the tops of those beds. And this is a fairly clear indication that we have bottom currents which are reworking the tops of the individual beds and that may well be responsible for why the change from sand to silt and mud in each bed is relatively sharp because the tops have been reworked. Something else we commonly see uh, of which there's an example here is that on the side of the levee facing inwards towards the channel you often get these collapses. So this is levy sediment, but it's chaotic because it's collapsed inwards or towards the channel. Let's take one final example of the channel system. This one is from Southern Tibet. It's a pretty, pretty big model. It's about four kilometers from one end to the other. And the bit we're interested in covers about 250 meters of vertical section. Now, if we, let's get rid of that. If we take this, here is a datum, it's the bottom of this rather marly section in the underlying slope sediments. We can take that as a stratigraphic datum. When we look at the base of this whole channel complex, we can see that it's cutting down towards the right. Again, it looks like it's a pretty low angle, but that's because we're looking at a very oblique section uh, through the channel, which is basically got flow more or less in this direction here. Uh, the whole lot is offset by this fault here, which is a kind of scissor fault that dies out in that direction. So looking at this, if we take a section along the river here, we can actually get a profile up through the channel fill. Let's um, zoom in a bit. Oops. Look at the lowermost point that we can get to in the channel fill and you see it's got some really extremely coarse grain material. See this boulder, it happens to be of uh, basaltic andesite, and it's sitting in a matrix of uh, structureless sand. So this has been transported in some kind of dense flow, either a dense sandy flow or some other kind of debris flow. The fact that it's sitting in a thick sand bed argues that Probably it was transported in a thick sandy flow like the ones that you see uh, today in the Monterey Canyon. Also near the bottom of the um, 
entire channel complex. We see a lot of uh, debris flows like this. In fact, there's a thick debris flow section right at the bottom here, and it's made up of rafts of the related levee sediments with cobbles and pebbles scattered through it, very chaotic. Above that, we see class-supported uh, conglomerates, which are indicative of a lot of bypass down the channel. This material is largely being moved as, as bed load underneath bypassing um, sand carrying turbidity currents going further down the system. Uh, and we also see big rafts of thin bedded fine grain material uh, floating around in that. As we go further up, we start to see more evidence of aggradation. So look at this, we've got not only the class supported conglomerates, but we've also got fairly thick beds, graded beds, dominated by sand and pebbly sand with conglomerates at the base. So we're starting to grade the material within the channel film. But this is also quite capable of moving boulders along the bed. And as we go higher still, what we find is that it rapidly finds into these thin to medium bedded uh, turbidites. Same here. And those are overbank to a channel complex, which is off to the left here. So the whole depositional axis has shifted from one place to another. And as we go still further up, we come up towards the bottom of the next channel complex. There it is there. And again, it's dominated by class supported conglomerate indicating uh, a lot of bypass. And that's that overlies uh, chaotic rotated blocks and debris flows, which, as I said before, are quite common at the base of each one of these channel complexes and at the base of the channel system overall. So, so much for channels. Let's just quickly take a look at lobes and sheets. Now, what we're seeing here are channels coming down these, what would have been described as, as canyons, and then splays made up of sheets at the bottom where the flows become unconfined. Now, uh, sheets can occur in a range of settings, often associated with some kind of topographic confinement and frequently on structured slopes, like this cartoon of a salt dominated slope and you see confined settings here. Uh, and the topography can be either dynamic, as would be the case with mobile salt, or static, where you've got um, non-mobile substrate. And sheets can also be deposited where flows become uh, unconfined, either at the mouth of a channel or where they break through a crevasse in the side of the channel, or where the gradient changes. So let's take a look at some examples uh, from outcrop. Okay, this is a Pennsylvanian uh, sheet system in northwestern Argentina, and it's shows the differences between confined and unconfined systems. Now, what do I mean by uh, confined and unconfined? Let me just go back to my PowerPoint presentation here for a second. Okay, confined uh, is where the flows that deposit the turbidites actually reach the bounding topography. Now, I'm simplifying somewhat here. Um, and as a consequence of that, we're going to see onlap all the way around the basin, and there tends to be very small variation across the basin in the facies and thickness of the turbidites, certainly less than in this case, where the flows are unconfined, they're not reaching the uh, margins of the basin, and we tend to see downlap um, at the margins of each one of these bodies, composite bodies that are built up 
from unconfined turbidites. Now, what determines whether the, the flows reach the basin margin uh, is dependent on the ratio of the efficiency of the flows, that's their mobility, their ability to, to continue moving across the basin floor, and the basin size. And efficiency is a function of largely of the flow size and the amount of mud that's contained in suspension. Highly efficient flows will reach the basin margins and inefficient flows won't. And it's possible to have very large basins with confined turbidites in them if the flows are efficient, very large or have a lot of mud in or both. And similarly, it's possible to have very small basins, but with unconfined turbidites within them if those flows are very inefficient, either very small or very sandy. So let's go back to the strap box here. <clears throat> so this system crops out over an area of about seven kilometers by 12 kilometers. Um, it crops out over a, a pretty large area. It's the same, um, it is about a thousand meters of relief in this system. So we've got a good deal of control on it. And it consists of a succession of lobe complexes, that is unconfined systems, and one sheet complex. Um, and as you can see, it is spectacularly exposed. So we can be reasonably confident uh, with what we're saying about this system. So there's that stack of, of lobe complexes, uh, one, two, three, four, and here is our sheet system up here and then there's another low complex sitting on top of it before we get into the overlying deltaic sediments. Now let me give you some sense of scale here. The model itself, whoops, the model itself is 800 meters across so we're looking here at about one seventh of the entire length of the outcrop and that also gives you some sense of the thickness of stratigraphy that we're looking at here that's about half a kilometer of stratigraphy so in the lobe complexes if I pick the right button here okay. in the low complexes what we see is that the individual beds can't be traced very far so we're looking at these sections which are relatively close to one another kilometers three or kilometer apart and you cannot match the individual beds from one section to another and these stack up into units which are a few meters thick uh, with considerable facies variation and and those units are compensationally stacked so the thick part of this unit is sitting on top of the thinner part of that one and likewise the thick part of this is sitting on the thinner part of that of course this stacking actually occurs in three dimensions so it's very difficult to represent it just with a whole other two dimensional sections here now these things that I said show significant uh, lateral facies variations. So these are two examples from a relatively sand poor example and a relatively sand rich example. And what we see is that the thickness of individual beds and the percentage of sand in them in this more sand poor examples show a more linear geometry and the sandy ones tend to show a more step-like geometry, which rather implies that the sediment transport processes, the flow processes, <clears throat> are varying more substantially uh, as we reach this step point here. So something is changing dramatically. Now. now, there are also some examples of lobes that have hybrid beds at their fringes. Now hybrid beds are beds that seem to contain elements of uh, both turbidite and debrite. So let's, let's take a look at some examples of facies of 
um, hybrid beds. Now, there are many, many different varieties of hybrid beds. These examples are, are just what we see in this particular system. And we've differentiated five different facies, but actually there's a, there's a continuum. Here we see these very, very matrix rich uh, sands and then some clean ripple cross laminated sand sitting on top. So it looks as if we've got um, debris flow or slur slur slurry flow, um, followed by some more dilute flow. Uh, sometimes these very, very matrix rich sands have slumped fragments or rafts of the underlying uh, thin bedded sediments. And sometimes they're just choked with shale clasts. Now, the fact that the lobes are fringed by these fasces suggests that the um, porosity and permeability distributions in these is going to be uh, substantially different from what we see in examples like this. So let's go to the sheet system. Let's get an idea of the scale here. This model is about 100 meters across, so we're just looking at a small fragment. It's pretty thick bedded. We zoom in and look at some examples in here. So that's over a meter, that's over a meter. So we're looking at beds which are a meter plus in thickness. And some are substantially thicker than that. So you see human being for scale here. I think this is actually Vicky. Now, one of the, the principal differences between this and the lobe turbidites is that in um, this system, the individual beds can be correlated over the entire outcrop. So this is a, um, about seven kilometers along. And uh, in fact, these individual beds can be correlated with the next outcrop um, of the lower of the of the upper Paleozoic, which is about 12 kilometers away. The individual beds can be matched. And we also find not just the bed thicknesses, but the fasces are very consistent uh, across the entire unit. If we look at the rate of thinning of individual beds, this is normalized to uh, value of, of one in the most proximal part of the bed, we see that these sheets, true sheets, have very, very small thinning rates once we get away from the input point. Whereas the beds in the lobes have much more rapid thinning rates. And in fact, the beds in the lobes thin according to a different um, law, they're logarithmic, and the beds in the sheet systems thin according to a power law. And they also show quite a distinctive um, facies. If we look at a factor analysis of various parameters of the facies that we can measure in the outcrop, so we can be uh, at least semi-quantitative, we find that the lobes show a distinct uh, trend from the axis to the fringe and the sheets are an outlier. Okay, well, I think I've reached the end of, of my um, stint here, apart from the final example of a confined turbidite system. And this one is much smaller. So this is in a 
Paleo Fjord. The fjord's only about a kilometre wide. Um, we have several kilometres length of it exposed. Um, but this fjord apparently had a sill, uh, as many fjords do, a shallow sill at the, at the down dip end. So the turbidites were very largely completely contained within this very small basin. And we see that the individual beds are very, very tabular. You can trace them all the way around the outcrop. Individual beds are highly recognizable from one place to another. And many of them have quite thick mud caps because while the sand may depo be deposited fairly rapidly from the turbidity current, the mud tends to stay in suspension for quite a long time. And in an open basin, very often a lot of the mud escapes down dip in a enclosed basin like this, there's nowhere for it to go. So quite often, ponded or confined systems show thick mud caps. And as I said, the individual beds can be correlated all the way around the outcrop, rather as we saw in the previous sheet system, um, sometimes with very little facies change. Now the structure of this uh, is synclinal, but this isn't tectonic. This is basically uh, compactional, and you can see that it's uh, compacted more in the middle than it has on the margins. The um, substrate is lower Paleozoic limestone, so completely rigid. And in fact, in parts of this system, you can see irregularities in the dips where the system has compacted over irregularities on the fjord floor. Okay, well, I think I'm done here. It's time to hand over now to Vicky. So perhaps Gabriella, you could just switch for us. Okay, can you hear me, Ben? Yes, I can hear you. So excellent, thank you, Ben. Well, uh, Ben already talked about flow, flow confinement and flow efficiency and the importance of flow behavior. Well, the percentage of sand and mud has a very important influence in the, on the nature of onlap character. So in very sandy systems, especially those involving large flows, pinch out at basic margins tend to be abrupt, as shown in these examples. So in here we have a, a very high net growth system. This is a seismic data from upper slope of Gulf of Mexico. This is the onlap surface in here. And we can notice that see these uh, reflectors here are, are quite parallel all the way towards the onlap surface. In this uh, okra that here, located in southern France, uh, we are looking at anode formation. As well, we can see this single turbidite, this sandstone in here, pinch outs abruptly against this uh, onlap surface. And what we have in here is the slope sediment, very, very fine grain sediment. So, if we move on. There. Perfect. If we have some systems in which we have more muddy flows, uh, we tend to have more draping onlap. So in here we have the same data from upper slope of Gulf of Mexico. In this case, we have low net to growth. In here we can tell that this is the onlap surface in here. And we can see that these reflectors, they are quite parallel until they reach the onlap surface in here and they drape the slope. So what's going on here is actually the angle of climb of the base of the slope, which is this in here, is different from the angle of the slope represented in the seismic image in here. So down here we have a photograph, an ocro photograph uh, from uh, California that we can see that these turbidites are pinching out onto this, this um, on lap surface in here, and we can see some on lap with draping. 
Uh, so now let me go to uh, Stratbox to show you some of these simple onlaps. So in here, what we have in this model, which is located in southern France, this is Grand Collier area. This model, just for the record, is about 300 meters. And if we zoom in, we can see that this unit that we're going to take a close look is about 40 meters. So if we zoom in, and we twist the model, we can see this nice overlap in here. We can see, just let me grab the pencil. We can see here the overlap surface and how this thick sandstone, which are more or less about 1, 1.6 meters, something like that, it thins toward the left and pinch out. Then we have, literally, we have some beds that we can see the base. Sorry, just let me grab the pen again. The base and the top, that they remain sometimes virtually parallel until they hit the basin margin. So this is a very nice model to see this kind of simple overlaps. And just a little reminder that this sediment that we have in here are slope sediment, very fine grain sediment, muddy silts. And let's take a look and how this overlap look at Okro. So this is Gabriel. Gabriel is a tall man, 180. And we can see that this layer in here things toward the left. If we zoom, zoom in, we can see some internal or secondary onlaps. And again, this thicker sandstone abruptly onlapping onto a surface to the left of the, of the photograph. Then to show you a little bit about how this thin to be like look like. These are very coarse sandstones, structureless. And here we can start to note, sorry about that. Just let me click on this. That's it. Some of these layers in here start to thin to the left. In here what we have actually this unit here it's maybe a couple of events because we have some erosion surface in here, an amalgamation surface. And then we have some thin better turbidite, which thins and pinch out to the left. Lastly, we have a very nice slab unit on top of all this. Gabby again pointing out all distorted, slumped turbidites. And on top, we have this very erosive surface in here, actually, we think we have uh, the sandy channel or more conglomeratic eroding the lower unit. So now let's take a look in another model. Let's go a little bit northern to Grand Coyer area. This is Troyes-Evêché Subbasin, still in, in France, but before starting to work and play with this spectacular model. Just let me show you some, well, this is about 1K in length and about 300 meters in thickness. So from this model, what we're still learning, but what it shows is actually that these on-lap surfaces, surfaces, they are not plain. They are not that easy. So it has actually some, it has actually some, has some irregularities. We can see here that this unit is overlapping here, overlapping there, and then overlapping a little bit here. It's a little bit of tectonic. We zoom in 
and we twist it a little bit. Opa. We can tell that these turbidites in here are in filling some humps and bumps first until we start to have the filling of, of the rest of the of the basin in here. So we twist it a little bit. This is very nice. We can see this all these units is all up in here. And actually the lower bit in here appear to the left, to the right, sorry. Just let me grab a photograph to show you better. This lower unit pinching out to the right and pinching out to the left. So this is a very nice model that teaches that an all-lap surface is not plain. It's actually very complicated. Uh, we, we, we're still dealing with, with this model because it has a lot to, to tell about. We have different sandstone packages, more shitty like tabular, and then on top of that, we have some amal amalgamation, so probably some channels, sandy channels on top. And now, just let me go uh, to mass transport deposit. I will jump into mass transport deposit. I will show you some slides and then I will go to a uh, strat. Okay, so let's start with the MTDs. Uh, MTDs are the deposit of submarine landslide. MTD is a, is a term uh, used as uh, to classify different cohesive flows such as slides, slams, and debris flows, and they vary in size up to a thousand of kilometers, uh, cubic kilometers, sorry, and they are greater than 200 meters thick. thick. In here, we have a couple of seismic illustrations here to show several mass transport deposits. Uh, we can call it mass transport complexes as well. And in here we have a seismic showing the head wall scar and the rest of the mass moving towards a uh, down slope. Um, why do we care about mass transport deposit? Well, they constitute more than 60% of the water stratigraphic record. They can create accommodation space for the current. They uh, remove the seafloor topography, and because they are very fine grain, they are very good seals in hydrocarbon reservoir. Here, just to talk a little bit about the MTD domains, we have an extensional domain and a cooperational domain. Domain. In here, we can expect some uh, folds, district folds, some rotated blocks. We can see this in this size begin here, some extension. And then in the compressional bit, we can expect a folding and thrusting. And in here, in this confrontally, frontally, sorry, emergent MTD, we can see that this mass transport deposit hits a ramp in here. And we have a, this a false thrusting folds in, in here. So let me go to Stratbox to show you some of to show you an um, MTD model from Western Argentina. Just let me come here. Let's load this scene. We'll take them some seconds. Here we are. So before starting to play with this model, just let me show you how this large mass trample look like in seismic again. So this is an spectral decomposition volume. Here we can see this is large mass trample deposit. We have the base here, the middle bit, and the top was actually what I wanted to show you in this, in this model, some features concerning to all this uh, bit of, of the mass transport. So in here, we can see this gray strap in here. These are uh, groups, very erosional in here. In the middle bit, 
we can have some blocks. These are blocks actually, the different dots, and they are about the size of the of the blocks that we have in, in Cerro Bola in our MTD. And here we can see some foldings and bridges on, on, on the upper part or on the upper part of this master. So let's zoom in. This model is about 1K, and in here we have about nearly 200 meters. Just let me, there's just a bit of this mass transport deposit because this is actually cropping about 7K. So this is, again, Pennsylvania. Ben already showed some models from here. Here where we have it's about the K of a stratigraphy and a stack of different mass transport deposits. And all these mass transport are alternating between fluvial deltaics in here, more turbidites deltaics on top. And we can see here, I think I already grabbed this, yes, that this mass transport is very erosive. So we can, we have this in the seismic, these are probably groups. Then we have some blocks large blocks, several meters in length. And this, these blocks derive from the underlying fluvial deltas. And on top of that, we have the pond, the turbidite that we'll talk a little bit later. So let's go back to our model. Let's zoom in. Let's take a look. And we can see some of these blocks around here. Here. And if we click this card, we can see this large mass transport deposit from base to top. Again, we can trace all these large sandstone block. We have minors in here. The upper part of this mass transport, we can have some tubular raft then some topography created on top and the turbidite from the turbidite pinching out to the left. Just let me close this and clean this. If we zoom out here, we can see some compressional features on top of this mass transport, actually the upper part of this mass transport. These are thrust. We have some folding and some turbidite raft. If we click and we take a look at Okrop, how these folds look like, this is very nice. Folding, a lot of them, and some thrusting in the back. So now, If we pay attention carefully to the top of this mass transport, we can tell that this, that the top is not flat. So it has some irregularities. So it's creating topography. So it's actually it's creating um, a short wavelength topography on top which is quite complicated. And this layer that we see in here is a cogenetic turbidite related to this mass movement. So let's take a look in how these fascias look like. So in here, again, this is the top of the mass transport. We can see that this layer in here, sandstone layer, is actually, it's very coarse sand, that same composition of this mass transport deposit. It get thinner, thicker, that's the lower bit, but actually we have a mud cap. So this is the mud cap of that cogenetic turbidite. And then if we zoom in even a little more, you can see some thin bedded turbidite nearly pinching out towards the right, and some weird stratigraphy going on here, that it get thicker and thinner to the right is even a thicker bed. 
Then we have some balls, balls and pillows. This is foundering. This happens because this material in here is denser than whatever is here. So we can see that this uh, short wavelength topography where actually we start to have the, the very beginning or the infilling of this uh, mass transport, it is quite complicated until we have the rest of the bonding to rely on top of this pinky, pinkish unit that we have in here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about bonding. This card here shows uh, that mass transport deposit can create accommodation. And the examples that we are looking at the robot is actually, we have some surface bonding regarding to uh, extensional fold, as well as surface bonding related to folding, the presence of block and compactation, and as well as contractional folds. So if we take a look in bonded to just let me twist a little bit the model. So we can see in this view that this layer in here that I just show in a card, just pinch out to the right at the very first the lower bit of the ponder to be there as well, they unlap and pinch out to the right. So actually the sandy bits in here, sandy unit, is a above a, a long wavelength topography generated by this mass transport. But let's take a look in this card that they show how they look like. Again, if you can see the sandy bit of this cogenetic is missing, we have just the mud cup, the rest of the filling in here, and we have this unit Spinkish unit barrier posit turbidite. They are uh, med bedded. They are intercalated with, they are not visible in here, but with a uh, bad stone as well. And this is about 80 meters. But to the south of the okra, we can see that they thin uh, maybe until some few meters. So let's go back to this card where it show how this bonded turbidite actually we are about here and they they thin towards the left or to the south of our book so to talk just a bit about connectivity in here what we just saw about this uh, the very beginning of the infilling of this topography with that uh, Cogenetic tool with that of weird sand. We are just let me grab a pen which is not yellow. So we start to have this feeling here. Then the very first unit of the mass of the tool with eyes start to, to feel, start to appear, and we have some pinch outs and onlaps against these humps, these highs. And finally, we have. A, a, like a single, a continuous somebody. So we can tell that this, at least from the few meters to the uh, end of the succession, let's say more than 70 meters, it is connected. So very good lateral connection. And in here, just to show you this cutting here where we can see this is the top of the mass transport the very first unit, and then the sandstone body connecting all the sand. So just let me do like that. So just to finish in this model, we have an MTD that create topography. We have the ponder turbidites. And in this case, these are shale. This is a maximum floating that in this kind of if we think this is a reservoir, this is a very nice seal. We have a uh, two relights in here where, which are very well connected, uh, laterally connected, and this mass transport creating that topography. 
So if um, Ben doesn't have anything else to say or to make some comments, maybe he can uh, continue a little bit with the um, uh, outline of our course, Ben. He's gone. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Vicky. Hello, everyone. I think Ben may be having a little bit of issue with uh, his connection this afternoon. So perhaps what we could do, Vicky, uh, I think you were almost at the end of your presentation, weren't you? Yes. Um, okay, great. So maybe what we can do in the meantime, while we're waiting for Ben, hopefully to get reconnected, is that we can take a, um, take a look at the uh, some of the questions that have come in. And hopefully you'll be able to answer them, Vicky, <laughs> without, uh, without Ben's help. Sure, so sure. We'll go with that if that's okay. So there's a specific question there for Ben uh, from somebody that I think possibly he knows. So let's move on to this other one, perhaps from Mark. It's from Mark Shan. How well connected are the levies directly to the channel? Oh, there's Ben. Ben, you're back. I can see that you're back now. Let's get you back on the screen. Can you see Ah, that? okay. Okay. Hi there. How well connected are the levies to the... Mm -hmm. To the channel. Um, it's complicated because it rather depends on how effective those collapsed sediments are at, um, at providing seals. Um, if you have a, a, a fairly thick bedded proximal levy, uh, the collapse can actually enhance the connectivity because you put sand against sand and sometimes you get sand smears um, along the displacement surfaces. But with thinner bedded proximal levy, the likelihood is that you're going to um, decrease the connectivity between the levy and the channel belt. And of course, it's worth bearing in mind that the connectivity within the levy is, is excellent horizontally and very poor vertically. Um, so it's impossible to give a unique answer to that. And, and certainly there are examples. Um, just think of the um, L sand in Rampal, I think it is, in the Gulf of Mexico, where the gas is present in the levee and there's none in the channel fill, which is the other way around from what you might expect. Does that answer the question? Hopefully it does. Uh, we've also got another another question here that I'm just going to highlight. Um, so somebody I think that knows you here, um, Ben. So always interesting to hear Ben Nella talking about turbidites. Thanks for organising this. I wonder if Ben has any comment on bottom currents modifying reservoirs inside the channel belt. Is it an important process or not? Bottom currents may be amplified by the channel constraints. Um. I'm not sure. I think the jury's out on that, really, because it's only just recently that people have begun to consider how important um, non-gravity currents, the bottom currents and tidal currents are within channels. I think it rather depends on, on what is in the channel. Um, my intuition is that it's not really likely to actually modify what's in the channel because the most important reservoir component in the channel is going to be the coarser grain material. Now, if you look at many modern channels on the seafloor, what they have at the surface is mud, but of course the next big turbidity current that comes down is just going to flush all of that out. So it's really only the, the coarser grain sediments that remain um, that are going to constitute significantly, um, that are going to form most of the reservoir. And most of the bottom currents are actually in um, in channels. It's mostly tidal current, internal tides and internal waves that are likely to be having an effect on the, on the bed. And you can demonstrate that, that they do. But they're probably only going to be affecting the finer grain sediments. So my feeling is that the answer is that they're not important in modifying reservoirs. Okay, very good. Thank you. Oh, there's this, there's a uh, last bit of the question that I, yes. I missed. <laughs> Bottom currents can be amplified by the by the topography. Yes, certainly. Um, internal waves and tides for sure are because they they get amplified when they hit the slope. 
and then they get funneled into the into the channels. Contra currents is a little bit more complicated. Um, that's that's too big a subject, I think, for me to tackle here. But um, if whoever the question is wants to contact me, so that's like, oh, it's, it's it's like, it's, it's like, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. we can talk about that offline. It's a complicated. Yes. Perfect. And perhaps uh, perhaps you could uh, use the chat on the webinar um, to, to carry on any of these conversations. Uh, Jose has my email. Anyway. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. And then we have another one here from Octavio, which I'm just going to share. Um, about how old would you say is the system in northwest Argentina? Uh, 321. We um, dated. <laughs> Yeah, it's right on the um, Bashkirian Serpukovian boundary. Um, so, yeah, basically Mississippi and Pennsylvania. Mississippi and Pennsylvania, yeah. yeah. That, right. that flooding surface at the top of the ponded turbidites is the post glacial eustatic sea level rise. Yes, and we did some dating, and it was 323. Sorry about that thing. <laughs> Million years. So, we are there. Dealing with the Mississippi and Pennsylvania boundary, actually, yes, Bashkirian. <clears throat> Thank you. So, oh, there's another one here from Mark. Um, is it the sheet or the lobe analog at the base of a slope or high on slope? Deltaics are very close above. <clears throat> I'm not sure I've done that question. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in that um, example from um argentina where we have a pretty hefty glacier eustatic sea level fall uh, that's responsible for driving those um deltaics over the top um and there's there's also some complicated glacial isostasy which we're still trying to figure out but that's mainly a glacial eustatic effect um so yeah it's not super deep water but when you think about a 200 meter thick um, mass transport deposit that still has deep water sediments on top of it you've clearly got quite a bit of accommodation uh, during the deep water section um, so it's it's complicated but I, uh, does that answer your question i hope it does and right. there was another question that came in earlier about how representative do you think these examples are? <laughs> well, the more examples you have, the better. Um, the more examples you have, the better you can build generic models. And of course, models don't completely describe the outcrop. You know, it's, um, the rather trivial example I give is that, you know, the average family has 2.4 children and I don't know any families that have 2.4 children it's a, a distillation of of data which gives you a, a guide I mean like material like the bound sequence and things like that um we've looked at a fair few outcrop systems and there's a lot that's now described in the literature I think um one can take individual elements of these systems that are going to give you pointers to what you might expect in the surface subsurface but i would reiterate what i said at the beginning you can't expect any one system to be an analog a direct analog for any other system some are more similar than others but i wouldn't expect to be able to take these examples and just lay them on top of something in the subsurface okay thank you and then one last one I have here is, do you think that the ponded turbidites on top of the mass transport deposits could realistically act as reservoirs? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I showed that in, in, in the previous year, showing the modern. Exactly. I mean, the, the, the volumes are uh, quite large enough. Um, the example that Vicky showed has a, a wonderful seal on the top of it. The only complication is, and I've seen an example of this in the subsurface, that if you if you drill into different lows at different deep spots, you can end up with different fluid contacts, but they're on the same pressure gradient, which can be a little bit confusing. 
Very good, thank you. Well, I don't think there are any more questions at the moment that have come in. Um, but what? So thank you both for that uh, whiz, uh, virtual field trip on the um, on the the virtual um, on the deep water short course that you've just given us there. Um, now we have here a course that you will be running in um, in January. Perhaps you could give us a little bit more of an idea of what that's all about and how it runs. Yeah, this will be a much more extensive look at many of the things that we've just skipped over very superficially here. I mean, it's in, in an hour, it's um, it's a pretty tall order to try and, and get the message across, but um, the course will be very heavily based on virtual outcrop, uh, of which we have many more examples. Um, and we'll be using those to illustrate the points that we've made here in a good deal more depth. It will be um, half days, um, three and a half to four hours per day, over a week, over five consecutive days. And we'll both be involved in delivering that. That's right. And so it's the five days, isn't it, as you say, and it will be a mixture, obviously, of uh, teaching uh, uh, through uh, PowerPoint presentation and uh, asking participants to take part in examples and exercises that you'll give them to do using Strapbox as the software to be using that, which is the collaborative software that we use in this reality, um, to allow participants to uh, annotate, interpret, analyse uh, the 3D models that you put in front of them and then that they can feed back their answers to you and you can discuss, uh, you can come to sort of some conclusions kind of about what everybody has seen and what they haven't and uh, point them to perhaps some new insights that they might not have necessarily seen when going out into the field themselves to perhaps some of the locations. Some of the models that you use are in quite difficult locations to get to, aren't they? So perhaps mm -hmm. seeing like this is another opportunity for those that, that perhaps wouldn't go out to these specific locations themselves <laughs> well not only that but um because we draw examples from all over the world we can include things that it would be virtually impossible to do in a in a, a real live field trip of course there's no substitute for having your nose on the rocks but we can bring something different to this which is a breadth uh, that it would be impossible to to provide on the outcrop but also some of the views that we can get of these outcrops um, with the drone based models give you perspectives that it would just be impossible to get from the ground. Um, so I think there's, there's obviously there are minuses to not being able to get out into the rocks, but there are a good many pluses in being able to do a, a virtual field trip like this. And have you, um, have you both through using uh, 3D models and seeing these different uh, views, as you say, have you managed to um, gain further insights yourselves that you perhaps wouldn't have done out in the field when you're up close and personal with these? With oh, these absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as you say, some of these things would be absolutely impossible to access. The one that's on the screen right now, for example, mm -hmm. and it's high in the Alps and you can see that that is a cliff it would be completely impossible to access that. Exactly. So thank that you. is about 3,000 meters high. This is in the French Alps. And you can just reach that angle of that photograph with the drone. And then after we build up the model, as I show in that spectacular bigger biggest uh, model, we can see that it has a lot of three-dimensionality. Three so we can twist and play and learn from this model, as I said before. Uh, it's a great tool actually to to keep on learning. Mm, great. So um, just for those of you that haven't had a chance to, to hear very much about us, so Image Reality, we um, develop software solutions for geosciences in particular, so that allow um, geologists and engineers to uh, use software in a different way, so to interact with it in a, in a different perspective. So bringing different data sets together, as you saw in the examples that Vicky and Ben gave, and bringing them uh, within the software <clears throat> so that you can see those different perspectives that you have, bring them all in together, putting different pieces of the puzzles together to gain a different insight. And the other the other very important point is that obviously then it allows you to the possibility of collaborating with others. So 
this lends itself very well to the types of examples and these sorts of uh, very brief field trips such as these webinars but also to uh, an in-depth you know five-day virtual uh, course such as the one that um, Ben and Vicky will be uh, will be offering here on the 23rd to 27th of January next year. Um, it's, the software is also used um, by a number of companies in the oil and gas sector and the energy sector to you know in their day-to-day -to, -day to look at analogues of, uh, of outcrops and to study those for the purposes of uh, you know for their working day for exploration and such like and um, it's also a way of um, being able to um, so apart, apart from that we also have access to um, catalogues of data sets which you can use and you can subscribe to to give examples analogues from different areas that you know might have some correlation to the, to the work that you're doing and um, and also that it's used apart from in the day-to-day -day, it's used obviously to um, help in the uh, training you know, in-house courses can also be done with the uh, with the software so for participants such as these that might be joining you then in January um, the um, software is included in the price of the, of the, of the participants um, a seat if you like to attend and we did one recently didn't we in December last year which brought together teams from uh, three different areas they're based in uh, Bogota, Rio and uh, and in Houston they hadn't really had the opportunity to work in that manner before which I think was really helpful for them wasn't it because it brought together those teams in a, in a different way that perhaps they'd been able to do before um, uh, in in person I and mean, that was during Covid wasn't it so that was slightly different but I think you know the new hybrid situation of of doing in-person uh, you know meetings and uh, trips to um, to outcrops is still going to happen but perhaps considering this new opportunity with the software that it allows you to do those uh, collaboration in a different manner slightly different manner anything Ben or Vicky that you'd like to add yourselves I know I think the only thing I would say is that um, I always welcome oh, communications from other people you know if they have questions or want discussions or thank you conversations always welcome to get in touch either through linkedin or via image reality or for those of you who've already had contact with me i still use the same email address Aberdeen university email address perfect perfect okay well i think probably um that wraps up the webinar for today if there aren't any more questions coming in from anybody i don't see that there are any others coming in oh we have something here from mark oh there is something hold on just a second while i just show it on the screen <clears throat> thanks ben and vicky great to hear your talk do you think we can differentiate purely turbiditic uh, channel systems from mixed audio contourite turbidite systems and outcrop on lap style architectural elements ge geometrical relationships for example Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very hot topic, and I, to, if I'm absolutely honest, I don't think I understand enough about mixed contourite turbidite systems to be able to generalise. I can think of some systems where you would be able to tell the difference from the geometries. I'm not at all sure what I would expect them to look like in outcrop or in, in core. And I'm sure there are other systems where um, it will be very difficult to differentiate. But I think one point that's worth making here is that what we refer to as mixed contourite turbidite systems can include things which are which include elements of contrite and turbidite, which are not synchronous. So you have a turbidite system that's active over a period of time and a contrite system that's active over a period of time. Some that are active over the same period of time, but not coincident. So um, for example, we might talk about the system of, of levees, and perhaps this is something that Mark has in mind where we see the tops of the individual turbidites in the levee apparently being reworked by bottom currents. Um, and you could call that a mixed system. And then there are some systems like um, 
the regularly spaced slope channels in the in the northern margin of the South China Sea, where it's been postulated that the flows themselves are interacting and that the deposits, the, the geometry of the deposits in those systems is actually being determined by the direct interaction of the two kinds of currents. Um, at outcrop, honest answer is I'm not sure I could tell beyond my experience of looking at these levee sediments. And then we can be relatively confident that that's what we're seeing because we know mm -hmm. these things are levees. They look like levees. They show the same facies and thickness, net to gross variations as you're going to get in, in levees, but the paleo currents are going in the wrong direction. So they look different for sure. But the other things on lap style, architectural elements, geometrical relationships, I would be going beyond my expertise at this stage to give a definitive answer to that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, well, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending the webinar today, for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend. Uh, thank you to Ben and Vicky for putting this together for us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.